Chapter 36 Come on, I'll show you the real dirt, Brissenden said to him one January evening. They had dined together in San Francisco, and were at the ferry building, returning to Oakland, when the whim came to him to show Martin the real dirt. He turned and fled across the waterfront, a meager shadow in a flapping overcoat, and Martin straining to keep up with him. At a wholesale liquor store he bought two gallon demijohns of old port, and with one in each hand boarded a Mission Street car, Martin at his heels, burdened with several quart bottles of whiskey. If Ruth could see me now, was his thought, while he wondered as to what constituted the real dirt. Maybe nobody will be there, Brissenden said, when they dismounted and plunged off to the right into the heart of the working-class ghetto south of Market Street. In which case you'll miss what you've been looking for so long. And what the deuce is that? Martin asked. Men, intelligent men, and not the gibbering non-entities I found you consorting with in that trader's den. You read the books, and you found yourself all alone. Well, I'm going to show you tonight other men who have read the books, so that you won't be lonely any more. Not that I bother my head about their everlasting discussions, he said at the end of the block. I'm not interested in book philosophy, but you'll find these fellows' intelligences and not bourgeois swine. But watch out, they'll talk an arm off of you on any subject under the sun. Hope Norton's there, he panted a little later, resisting Martin's effort to relieve him of the two demijohns. Norton's an idealist, a Harvard man, prodigious memory. Idealism led him to philosophic anarchy, and his family threw him off. Father's a railroad president, and many times millionaire, but the son starving in Frisco, editing an anarchist sheet for twenty-five a month. Martin was little acquainted in San Francisco, and not at all south of Market, so he had no idea of where he was being led. "'Go ahead,' he said. "'Tell me about them beforehand. What do they do for a living? How do they happen to be here?' Hope Hamilton's here, Brissenden paused and rested his hands. Strawn Hamilton's his name, hyphenated, you know, comes of old southern stock. He's a tramp, laziest man I ever knew, though he's clerking, or trying to, in a socialist cooperative store for six dollars a week. But he's a confirmed hobo, tramped into town. I've seen him sit all day on a bench and never a bite past his lips. And in the evening, when I invited him to dinner, restaurant two blocks away, have him say, Too much trouble, old man. Buy me a package of cigarettes instead. He was a Spencerian like you till Kreese turned him on to materialistic monism. I'll start him on monism if I can. Norton's another monist. He only affirms naught but spirit. He can give Kreese and Hamilton all they want, too. Who is Kreese? Martin asked. His rooms were going to. One time professor, fired from university, usual story. A mind like a steel trap. Makes his living any old way. I know he's been a street fakir when he was down. Unscrupulous. Rob a corpse of a shroud. Anything. Difference between him and the bourgeoisie is that he robs without illusion. He'll talk Nietzsche, or Schopenhauer, or Kant, or anything, but the only thing in this world, not excepting Mary, that he really cares for, is his monism. Hackel is his little tin god. The only way to insult him is to take a slap at Hackel. Here's the hangout. Brissenden rested his demijohn at the upstairs entrance, preliminary to the climb. It was the usual two-story corner building, with a saloon and grocery underneath. The gang lives here, got the whole upstairs to themselves, but Crease is the only one who has two rooms. Come on. No lights burned in the upper hall, but Brissenden threaded the utter blackness like a familiar ghost. He stopped to speak to Martin. There's one fellow, Stevens, a theosophist. Makes a pretty tangle when he gets going. Just now he's dishwasher in a restaurant. Likes a good cigar. I've seen him eat in a ten-cent hash house and pay fifty cents for the cigar he smoked afterward. 
I've got a couple in my pocket for him, if he shows up. And there's another fellow, Perry, an Australian, a statistician, and a sporting encyclopedia. Ask him the grain output of Paraguay for 1903, or the English importation of sheetings into China for 1890, or at what weight Jimmy Britt fought battling Nelson, or who was welterweight champion of the United States in 68, and you'll get the correct answer with the automatic celerity of a slot machine. And there's Andy, a stonemason, has ideas on everything, a good chess player, and another fellow, Harry, a baker, red-hot socialist and strong union man. By the way, you remember the cooks and waiters strike. Hamilton was the chap who organized that union and precipitated the strike. Planned it all in advance, right here in Creese's rooms. Did it just for the fun of it, but was too lazy to stay by the Union. Yet he could have risen high if he wanted to. There's no end to the possibilities in that man, if he weren't so insuperably lazy. Brissenden advanced through the darkness till a thread of light marked the threshold of a door. A knock and an answer opened it, and Martin found himself shaking hands with Creese. A handsome brunette man, with dazzling white teeth, a drooping black mustache, and large flashing black eyes. Mary, a matronly young blonde, was washing dishes in the little back room that served for kitchen and dining room. The front room served as bedchamber and living room. Overhead was the week's washing, hanging in festoons so low that Martin did not see at first the two men talking in a corner. They hailed Brissenden and his demijohns with acclamation, and, on being introduced, Martin learned they were Andy and Perry. He joined them and listened attentively to the description of a prize-fight Perry had seen the night before, while Brissenden, in his glory, plunged into the manufacture of a toddy and the serving of wine and whiskey and sodas. At his command, bring in the clan, Andy departed to go the round of the rooms for the lodgers. We're lucky that most of them are here. Brissenden whispered to Martin. There's Norton and Hamilton. Come on and meet them. Stevens isn't around, I hear. I'm going to get them started on monism if I can. Wait till they get a few jolts in them, and they'll warm up. At first the conversation was desultory. Nevertheless, Martin could not fail to appreciate the keen play of their minds. They were men with opinions, though the opinions often clashed, and, though they were witty and clever, they were not superficial. He swiftly saw, no matter upon what they talked, that each man applied the correlation of knowledge, and had also a deep-seated and unified conception of society and the cosmos. Nobody manufactured their opinions for them. They were all rebels of one variety or another, and their lips were strangers to platitudes. Never had Martin, at the Morses, heard so amazing a range of topics discussed. There seemed no limit, save time, to the things they were alive to. The talk wandered from Mrs. Humphrey Ward's new book to Shaw's latest play, through the future of the drama to reminiscences of Mansfield. They appreciated or sneered at the morning editorials, jumped from labor conditions in New Zealand to Henry James and Brander Matthews, passed on to the German designs in the Far East and the economic aspect of the Yellow Peril, wrangled over the German elections and Babel's last speech, and settled down to local politics, the latest plans and scandals in the Union Labor Party administration and the wires that were pulled to bring about the coast seamen strike. Martin was struck by the inside knowledge they possessed. They knew what was never printed in the newspapers, the wires and strings and the hidden hands that made the puppets dance. To Martin's surprise, the girl, Mary, joined in the conversation, displaying an intelligence he had never encountered in the few women he had met. They talked together on Swinburne and Rossetti, after which she led him beyond his depth into the bypaths of French literature. His revenge came when she defended Matterlink, and he brought into action the carefully thought-out thesis of the shame of the sun. Several other men had dropped in, and the air was thick with tobacco smoke, 
when Brissenden waved the red flag. "'Here's fresh meat for your axe, Crease,' he said. "'A rose-white youth with the ardor of a lover for Herbert Spencer. Make a hackalite of him, if you can.' Crease seemed to wake up and flash like some metallic magnetic thing, while Norton looked at Martin sympathetically, with a sweet girlish smile as much as to say that he would be amply protected. Crease began directly on Martin, but step by step Norton interfered, until he and Crease were off and away in a personal battle. Martin listened, and Fain would have rubbed his eyes. It was impossible that this should be, much less in the labor ghetto south of Market. The books were alive in these men. They talked with fire and enthusiasm their intellectual stimulant stirring them, as he had seen drink and anger stir other men. What he heard was no longer the philosophy of the dry, printed word, written by half-mythical demigods like Kant and Spencer. It was living philosophy, with warm, red blood, incarnated in these two men till its very features worked with excitement. Now and again other men joined in, and all followed the discussion with cigarettes going out in their hands, and with alert, intent faces. Idealism had never attracted Martin, but the exposition it now received at the hands of Norton was a revelation. The logical plausibility of it, that made an appeal to his intellect, seemed missed by Crease and Hamilton, who sneered at Norton as a metaphysician, and who, in turn, sneered back at them as metaphysicians. Phenomenon and Noumenon were bandied back and forth. They charged him with attempting to explain consciousness by itself. He charged them with word jugglery, with reasoning from words to theory, instead of from facts to theory. At this they were aghast. It was the cardinal tenet of their mode of reasoning to start with facts and to give names to the facts. When Norton wandered into the intricacies of Kant, Kreist reminded him that all good little German philosophies, when they died, went to Oxford. A little later, Norton reminded them of Hamilton's law of parsimony, the application of which they immediately claimed for every reasoning process of theirs, and Martin hugged his knees and exulted in it all. But Norton was no Spencerian, and he, too, strove for Martin's philosophic soul, talking as much at him as to his two opponents. "'You know Berkeley has never been answered,' he said, looking directly at Martin. Herbert Spencer came the nearest, which was not very near. Even the stanchest of Spencer's followers will not go farther. I was reading an essay of Salaby's the other day, and the best Salaby could say was that Herbert Spencer nearly succeeded in answering Berkeley. "'You know what Hume said?' Hamilton asked. Norton nodded, but Hamilton gave it for the benefit of the rest. He said that Berkeley's arguments admit of no answer and produce no conviction. "'In his, Hume's mind,' was the reply. "'And Hume's mind was the same as yours. With this difference, he was wise enough to admit there was no answering Berkeley.' Norton was sensitive and excitable, though he never lost his head while Crease and Hamilton were like a pair of cold-blooded savages, seeking out tender places to prod and poke. As the evening grew late, Norton, smarting under the repeated charges of being a metaphysician, clutching his chair to keep from jumping to his feet, his gray eyes snapping, and his girlish face grown harsh and sure, made a grand attack upon their position. "'All right, you hackalites. I may reason like a medicine man, but pray how do you reason? You have nothing to stand on, you unscientific dogmatist with your positive science, which you are always lugging about into places it has no right to be. Long before the school of materialistic monism arose, the ground was removed so that there could be no foundation. Locke was the man, John Locke. Two hundred years ago, more than that even, in his essay concerning the human understanding, he proved the non-existence of innate ideas. The best of it is that, that is precisely what you claim. Tonight, again and again, 
you have asserted the non-existence of innate ideas. And what does that mean? It means you can never know ultimate reality. Your brains are empty when you are born. Appearances, or phenomena, are all the contents your mind can receive from your five senses. Then noumena, which are not in your minds when you are born, have no way of getting in. I deny, Kreis started to interrupt. You wait till I'm done, Norton shouted. You can know only that much of the play and interplay of force and matter, as impinges in one way or another on your senses. You see, I am willing to admit, for the sake of argument, that matter exists. But what I am about to do is to efface you by your own argument. I can't do it any other way, for you are both congenitally unable to understand a philosophic abstraction. And now, what do you know of matter, according to your own positive science? You know it only by its phenomena, its appearance. You are aware only of its changes, or of such changes in it as cause changes in your consciousness. Positive science deals only with phenomena, yet you are foolish enough to strive to be ontologists and to deal with noumena. Yet, by the very definition of positive science, science is concerned only with appearances. As somebody has said, phenomenal knowledge cannot transcend phenomena. You cannot answer Berkeley, even if you have annihilated Kant, and yet perforce. You assume that Berkeley is wrong when you affirm that science proves the non-existence of God, or, as much to the point, the existence of matter. You know I grant the reality of matter only in order to make myself intelligible to your understanding. Be positive scientists, if you please, but ontology has no place in positive science, so leave it alone. Spencer is right in his agnosticism, but if Spencer— but it was time to catch the last ferry-boat for Oakland, and Brissenden and Martin slipped out, leaving Norton still talking and Crease and Hamilton waiting to pounce on him like a pair of hounds as soon as he finished. "'You have given me a glimpse of fairyland,' Martin said on the ferry-boat. "'It makes life worth while to meet people like that. My mind is all worked up. I never appreciated idealism before, yet I can't accept it. I know that I shall always be a realist. I am so made, I guess. But I'd like to have made a reply to Crease and Hamilton, and I think I'd have had a word or two for Norton. I didn't see that Spencer was damaged any. I'm as excited as a child on its first visit to the circus. I see I must read up some more. I'm going to get hold of Salaby. I still think Spencer is unassailable. And next time I'm going to take a hand myself. But Brissenden, breathing painfully, had dropped off to sleep. His chin buried in a scarf, and resting on his sunken chest. His body wrapped in the long overcoat and shaking to the vibration of the propellers. End of chapter thirty-six.